Good evening. Obviously, <clears throat> I don't need to introduce myself to you because all of you know me because I know all of you. <laughs> so I'm not the <clears throat> we're going to have a, a formal introduction, but I guess that won't be necessary. As I look around the room tonight, I see people who help make history in Wadsworth, and we are not going to mention your names simply because you're not dead yet. And we're glad that you're not dead yet. Actually, the people about whom I'm going to be speaking are not nearly so exciting as some of the ones, <coughs> excuse me, some of the ones who, whose names you hear a great deal. Uh, you certainly have heard of the names of um, the two people who came in 1814, Oliver Durham and um, Daniel Dean. You've heard those names time and time again, and we certainly do, are going to revere them for what they were able to do. We've also heard the names of the Pardees. That name has come up so many, many times. As a matter of fact, they are probably related to people in this room today. As a matter of fact, if you are related to the Pardees and want to raise your hand, that would be nice because um, we'll be talking about your relatives a little bit. But we're not, going to, we're not going to dwell on those kinds of people. You also probably uh, have heard um, a lot of the other names that um, come to Wadsworth. For instance, the Frank's name and the um, Simcox name and so forth. And you're thinking to yourself, well, gee, I have not heard those names except that there are streets named after them. But there are streets named after them for a reason, because they did have a tremendous amount of influence here in Wadsworth. One of the names that you probably haven't heard a tremendous amount about is the Brown family. Now, yes, you have heard about John Brown, the abolitionist, and the fact is that Wadsworth was not his home, but he was here all the time. His, <clears throat> his father, <coughs> pardon me, his father was Owen Brown. However, the Frederick Brown was Owen Brown's brother. Now, Owen Brown was a good man, uh, did a tremendous amount. As a matter of fact, we're going to be talking about him a little bit, about some of the things that he did. But Frederick Brown was a, we would call him today an intellectual, probably. But when we talk about an intellectual, we're talking about a person who was able to read and write and did read and write. Understand, we're talking about 200 years ago where people didn't necessarily do that. As a matter of fact, there are probably those of you who here who have uh, white hair, or it should be white if it were not chemically assisted, that <clears throat> would uh, remember that in the days that we were growing up, not everyone had a high school education. Now, we talk about people today having uh, college educations, and yes, that's, that's very, very good. But that doesn't necessarily mean that these people who were without an education were without good instruction. And the Browns were certainly that way. The, <clears throat> as we know, um, and we're going to be talking more about the Browns, but one of the things that we probably should remember right off the bat about the Browns is that um, Woodlawn Cemetery actually was part of the Brown land holdings. And that's exactly what we had. They didn't have acreages, they had holdings. Now they bought, them, they bought their lands by acreage, but um, it was very, very little. It might, they would pay maybe a dollar an acre, or less than that, or sometimes a little bit more than that. And we are, we are aware of the fact that uh, the Browns had 11 acres where the cemetery is right now. And the reason they gave that um, piece of ground to the city for a cemetery was that <coughs> <coughs> I haven't had a frog in my throat all day long, and I know that probably waited for me to get here so that I could have it. The um, uh, Brown shot one of the Brown children died at a very young age, and uh, they buried her there. There's a cute little story that I like, and I would like to give it uh, tell about, about it right now, and that is that when uh, they, the Browns gave that cemetery. And incidentally, I'm going to be speaking in generalities rather than all of the individual names because there are so many of these. And if I get off on a tangent with one of the families and start talking about uh, Edward Brown, for instance, uh, I'll be, we'll be here until um, 
715. <laughs> Not really, probably way beyond that. But, so I'm going to be talking in generalities for a while. Then we're going to be more specific a little later on. The uh, one thing that, uh, the story that I like is that uh, he said, well, yes, uh, well, you can have those 11 acres. That's perfectly okay. You can bury people there and you can use it any way you want to, but you have to let me pasture my sheep there. Well, the community got a little bit upset, so we have a graveyard there and they have people, the sheep going around. People, that is the cheapest way to take care of a cemetery I can know of. If it weren't for the fact right now that we did not want to see about 400 sheep in our cemetery, we would not have to worry about absolutely anything. Sheep have a small muzzle. They can get right up to almost anything. They could go around those stones and it would be perfectly clean. Wouldn't cost us a cent. I mean, they would have had the food that they needed because they're eating the grass and we wouldn't have to pay for lawnmowers and gasoline and, and uh, then be frustrated about the fact that the grass is a little higher around the edges of the, of the tombstones and so forth. So he, he was permitted to let his sheep graze in there. Now that was very important because um, today we don't really consider ourselves as having to be farmers or uh, agriculturally inclined because uh, we have um, two or three grocery stores in Wadsworth. I'm not going to mention which, what they are because you all know what they are. Uh, and you just go buy your, thing, your things there. That didn't happen 200 years ago. They had to have their own livestock. They had to have their own uh, garden. They had to have their own uh, wheat uh, for flour and so forth. In 1814, um, the people who came here were indeed heroes. And they were heroes because they didn't know what they were going to find here. They came a fur distance, let me tell you, a fur distance, about 600 miles, without knowing what they were going to buy. Now, right now, if we were going to buy something 600 miles from now, let's say, for instance, in Connecticut, we wouldn't have to worry. We can get on the internet. As a matter of fact, if you had an address for um, 123 Main Street in Hartford, Connecticut, you could in enter that on the internet. Now, you might think that I know quite a bit about the internet. I had to really research quite a bit to get that little bit out to you <laughs> right now. But we have, <clears throat> they would show the house, and they would show the lawn, and show uh, the street in front of it, the street behind it, and so forth. That didn't happen 200 years ago. As a matter of fact, when they um, thought that they were going to come out here, they had what they would consider a long, long trip. And it certainly is long. Right now we can get from here to Hartford, Connecticut, probably in, um, what, six, eight, or not, about 10 hours, something like 10 or 10, 11, 11 hours. I'm going to read to you the trip that they made from Torrington, which is in Connecticut. And this is from the um, Annals of the Brown family. We started from Torrington, Connecticut to New Connecticut, October 4th, 1816, the memorable cold season when there was said to be frost every month of the year, which was attributed to the unusually large spots on the sun. I don't know how true that is, but nonetheless, that's what he said. Consequently, provisions and forage were high, oats and corn one dollar a bushel. Now that was high for them. Got to try to buy corn right now at one dollar a bushel. And other things in proportion, which made very expensive traveling. Our team was two stout yoke of oxen. It was not your modern automobile. Two stock yoke of oxen, which never failed. When we started out, there were folks enough to make a little funeral. I have no idea why he would have referred to the group of people who came as a little funeral, but evidently that was something that he felt was uh, extremely uh, cogent. I started with a good deal of resolution on foot, and it came so most of the way. So he actually walked a great deal of the way. Uh, again, I don't know why, but he did that. We crossed uh, the North River at Albany in a horse boat. We there saw one of the first steamboats that on American waters start from the dock from New York City. 
we crossed the Genesee on the boat propelled by a rope and the Cayuga River on an open bridge a half mile long. We came through the village of Buffalo, a village of Buffalo at that time, which had not been recovered, had not recovered from the effects of the British raid and fire. As we came up the lake, a road ran much of the way on the beach. In driving around one point of rocks, the water was so high that it washed away our tar bucket, which hung on the hind axle tree. I didn't realize that the bucket that you always see in westerns and and uh, was a tar bucket. And I imagine if I were to ask Dave, David Brodage, he would tell us what a tar bucket is. Is that right, David? He puts it on the axle, right? Okay. Actually, I did know that, but I want to let you know that David is in the audience and. When David is in the audience, I'm always a little bit concerned because he knows this history better than anybody else in the entire city. And he is here to critique me tonight and I will get a grade at the end. <laughs> we arrived in Braceville in Trumbull County. Now Trumbull County is in Ohio and we were in Trumbull County at that time because we at one time we were in Trumbull County, then we were in Portage County, and then we finally became Medina County. But we were in Trumbull County and Trumbull County ran all the way from the Pennsylvania border, somewhere very close to the Pennsylvania border, all the way out to what are called the Firelands. The Firelands are out there, oh, probably 60, 70 miles east, west of here. Uh, we arrived in Braceville, Trumbull County, on December 2nd. Now remember, he had started this, this whole journey uh, in, um, uh, what day did he start? Uh, quite a ways before that. Uh, that's right. Uh, and um, let's see here. On December, having uh, been eight weeks on the road and where we stayed over winter, they stayed in Trumbull County over the winter. During the winter, Father and Julius, his brother, made our necessary furniture, and Julius went to Buffalo in a sleigh to get Father's tools and some freight that failed to get up the lake in the fall. With a sleigh, he went all the way to Buffalo to get the... Now, why would he have to do that? Why didn't he go to the store to buy some? No stores, nothing to buy. In April, they went to Norton. Now, the Norton is our Norton, right next door here, and selected land that had been brought by the Reuben Walkwell in Winchester, Connecticut. They cleared about five acres, planted it with corn and potatoes, and sowed a few oats, but it was so late that the crops did not ripen well. They built a house, which was said to be the best house in town, for the logs were butted off and were hewn on the inside. Our house had no chamber floor, no chimney, nor was it chinked. Now, if you don't know what chinked is, it's the, uh, the art of uh, making a little um, indentation so that the logs can fit together much, uh, much better. I remember being out in the dark the first night and the light of the fire inside made me think of a tin lantern. So if they're not chinked, there's a, there are spaces between the two. We did not live very well the first two years, but we always had something to eat. Mother used to say that she had the same reason to be thankful that the wife of the shepherd of Salisbury Plain had. Don't know who Salisbury Plain and why she was thankful, but her mother was that thankful. For she always had salt. Now, salt was what they used for, what we typically use for refrigeration. They used that for making sure that things didn't spoil. We soon had a good cow. Joint, jointed corn and milk aplenty, well for supper. But I never liked potatoes and milk. For fruit, we had mandrakes, pumpkins, and crab apples. Before winter, our house was chinked and daubed. We had a good puncheon over the uh, floor overhead, a stick chimney from the floor, plain doors and glass windows, and the glass brought from Connecticut. And then it goes on to say that he was married and so forth and so on. That was the trip that they made from um, Torrington, Connecticut, and it took them approximately three months, something we can do right now, uh, say for instance, in nine hours. Now, <clears throat> At the same time that this was happening, we have another, this, oh, incidentally, these people came to Norton 
And when we talked about Norton, uh, we're not talking about, you know, we have the County Line Road and then the next um, inch over there is Norton Township and, and Summit County. That, had, that was not the way it was. There was no North, uh, um, North or South County Line Road. There was nothing more there than a, than a pathway. And there is even a dispute on some of the things that we have read. There's even a dispute as to whether they actually went to Norton. They could have been all the way into, halfway into Wadsworth. But nonetheless, according to the, to the, um, uh, to the definition of uh, where they said that they were, they were in Norton. Our people who came from, well, the people, I should say our people, the people who came from the east, that would be Connecticut and, and, um, uh, and uh, other states in, in the New England, first settled where the intersection of uh, Broad Street or um, Road, um, Greenwich Road, Broad Street, or sometimes called Greenwich Road at that point, and the South County Line Road intersect. And they believe, they believe that it was started, they, that they probably settled not right at the corner there, but perhaps maybe um, even a mile inside what is now the Corporation of Wadsworth. And when we talk about uh, Norton, we might as well be talking about Norton Wadsworth or Wadsworth Norton. When we talk about Chippewa, which now is Doylestown, we can talk about Wadsworth Chippewa, Chippewa Wadsworth, because the, con the um, confines were not so um, exacting at that time. But at the same time now, these people settled here, let's, let's call that in the northern part. And the, on the southern part of what we call now Wadsworth, the Pennsylvania Dutch came. And there were four or five of them who came right off the bat. The first one was in 1814, which of course was, uh, that was in the fall, the first one was Peter Waltz, John Welty, the first ones were John, Peter Waltz, John Welty, Catherine Waltz, Peter Jr., Christopher Razor, William Razor, Christian Razor, George Razor, Jacob Eberhard, John Jr., and Adam Smith. Now, why, is, why are they heroes? It's many, many reasons why they were heroes, and that's going to be a, a part of the a tapestry that we're going to have, um, hope, hope, hopefully we can develop a little later on, um, and that is that um, the people who came from the <coughs> East were essentially English. As a matter of fact, to the best of my knowledge, they were nothing but English or English descent. They came here um, from the families that came directly from England and um, settled there in Plymouth Rock and all the other places that we know about in history. The People who came from Pennsylvania were Germanic, completely Germanic. As a matter of fact, and we're going to go forward about 300 or 200 years right now, as a matter of fact, the greatest number of people in Wadsworth today are of German descent. 20% of everybody in Wadsworth, one out of every five, is of German descent. And this is what we would consider then to be one of the reasons that we would, cons we would, we would uh, classify those four or five people who came from Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Dutch as we call them today, as being the heroes because they actually brought with them some of the skills that others did not have nearly so well refined. And one of those skills was agriculture. The people in the, in the East were um, predominantly, well, they'd have to have a little bit of agriculture because they would not, be, would not have been able to live without it, obviously. But they were more in the mercantile kinds of things as well as in the um, um, maritime, maritime and mercantile, those two things, the two M's. And the people then who came from Pennsylvania were agricultural. And today, were, were not for the fact that we... Um, had those Pennsylvania Dutch, we may not have had the kinds of, of landscape, the kinds of farms that we had. Also, these people brought with them a different type of um, structure in their personal behavior as well as their religion. The people in um, the, <coughs> pardon me, in, in the East were essentially the uh, Presbyterian type people and the Methodists, 
but the ones who came from Pennsylvania were uh, Germanic and therefore mostly Lutheran and obviously we had some Mennonites, but the Mennonites did not come until a little bit later. About 1840 they started arriving in, in vast numbers. This is going to play um, uh, a little bit more uh, functionally uh, in a few minutes, but uh, for the time being, uh, notice that we have two different kinds of people here now. Then, with these families who came from, from the Pennsylvania Dutch, they brought others with them. The first hero that we're going to be talking about is going to be Jacob Everhard, um, because he actually, or John, not Jacob, uh, John Everhart, Jacob's father. John Everhart actually was able to buy a piece of land here, and when we talk about the land that we're talking about, that we're going to be describing, it's going to be at the county line, South County Line Road and the uh, East County Line Road. In other words, the, the farthest southeast corner of Wadsworth, Wadsworth Township, um, and if you need a, um, a point of reference, it'll be a, a very close to where the high church is right now. They settled, or they settled down there. And <clears throat> were it not for the fact that John Everhart was so determined to come here that he spent three years with Elijah Wadsworth in Canfield, now remember, Elijah Wadsworth didn't come to Wadsworth. He lived in Canfield, he was buried in Canfield. He became the first postmaster of Canfield. Uh, there's a museum in Canfield that's um, uh, buried. Um, there's a, uh, a um, monument in Canfield. He was 100% Canfieldian, if that's what they call themselves out there, Canfielders. But <clears throat> um, he tended his farm. John or Elijah Wadsworth was very wealthy, and he had um, a large farm. And John actually tended the farm there. That is a hero kind of a thing because he had no money, he had no way of getting here, but he knew fully well that he wanted to be here, and he wanted to bring his people here to bring from the Pennsylvania areas from which he came. He wanted to bring them here. Now that's a hero, as far as I'm concerned. He made all kinds of sacrifices. Now, many of you here might have looked at farms. Some of you might have worked on farms, but I suspect seriously that you didn't have to do it with the only tools being your pitchfork and perhaps a shovel. And the no tractors, they obviously would have horses. Even the plows were not that, that um, um, sophisticated at that time. So this man worked for three solid years so he could buy this little piece of property so he can bring his other friends over as well. And he brought over some very, very fine people. He brought over the Browses. You've heard of Browse Drive. He brought over the Franks. You've heard of Franks, uh, Franks uh, Avenue. The Wise family. You have probably have not heard of that, but the Wise family is, a, is the uh, family on which coal was discovered uh, in about 18, well, actually it was discovered about 1829, and people would pick it up and use it on their own, but it was discovered for commercial purposes many, many years later, and the Wise family. And I want to stop just for a second to tell you a little story about the Wise family. The Wise family farm, <clears throat> if you take Broad Street out to Silver Creek Road, and you go down Silver Creek Road and cross the railroad track, Immediately to the left, you will see a huge, huge configuration of uh, steel towers. And that's where Ohio Edison has its um, substation, or whatever they call those things, where they, they um, uh, distribute um, electricity to f four different states. Uh, I thought a substation was something that would be um, part of um, the city of Wadsworth and take care of maybe a couple of neighborhoods. But this one takes care of four states. It's a big, big substation. That was the farm, 97 acres on that farm. And <clears throat> the, uh, there are two things that happen, and I'm, I'm going to tell you about one of them, which is not too terrible. Well, I guess it's important for the girl, the girl who uh, was involved, but um, not too terribly important as far as history is concerned. The uh, Wise family lived there, and they had a daughter 
And uh, my understanding was, from what I've been able to read, that the daughter was in her mid-twenties. And when she wanted to go anywhere, she would have to obviously um, walk because there was no other way that she can get there. I remember also that um, this was something which was extraordinarily unusual as well for a girl to be able to do something like that, but she was able to do it. She did not walk out the lane and up the road, as probably she should have, so she took a shortcut. She took the hypotenuse of the triangle, and she walked up to the railroad, and there was reason that, according to one of the letters that we have um, <clears throat> researched, the reason that she walked up the railroad was that she thought it was shorter. Well, it wasn't really shorter, but it was a little smoother because the road was not uh, paved, obviously. It was a dirt road, and there was grass growing in it and so forth, and a railroad uh, seemed to be a little bit more uh, amenable to her ability to walk. She got there, and unfortunately, somebody had some other intentions for what, uh, what they, they thought that she was going to do. She thought she was going to go to town or whatever she was going to do, visit a friend, and he assaulted her. And she was left for dead, uh, supposedly, uh, and you know, she got up and she was able to walk. I don't know how she did that, but she was able to walk. And to this day, the, um, uh, there, is no, there is no evidence that um, there was anyone there. To this day, there is no evidence that she was assaulted, but she was injured in such a manner that an assault could have been the manner in which she was um, attacked. So um, for many, many years, and um, on a personal note, I knew the people who purchased the farm from the Wise family, which would have been in 1900 or so. I mean, I, was, I wasn't there in 1900, but I knew the people, and they had the story, and I heard it told time and time again of how this uh, virtuous girl uh, was um, uh, attacked on the railroad. But I've also heard that um, it turned out uh, that she was not, um, and I'm not going to make any judgments here, but that the, the, that's not the way it happened. Now, the other thing about the Wise, fam about the wise uh, property, and here again we have our big heroes, and we're gonna, I'm going to have to give you just a little bit now because we're talking 1829, and then the next thing we're going to be talking about, about the, when we come back to it, will be <clears throat> about uh, 15 to 20 years later when they actually discovered coal there, or when they did discover where they actually started uh, mining coal there. But <clears throat> and the, while we are talking about that, I, we need to say that what we see right now is this configuration of big steel towers about which we know very, very little, but we know fully well that they're um, uh, broadcasting or whatever they do with electricity. They're sending, they're uh, sending electricity all over four different states. At that time, the tallest thing was the tree, and there were millions of trees on the property. 97 acres of trees, and very, very little was uh, tillable. Now, that's going to be important when we come back and talk about the coal mines because the trees um, were actually cut down and sawed off and then given or sold to the railroads. And we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. But in, the other, in, in other words, we're, we're saying here that <clears throat> we had the Browses, the Franks, and the Wises who came a little bit later. Then, here we come with more, more people who are heroes in Wadsworth. Albert Hinsdale, <coughs> excuse me, father of Wilbert, and he recorded the first-hand description on the trip from New England. I just read that to you. Albert's father, Elisha, was a Revolutionary War veteran and made cloverleaf axes. I've never seen a cloverleaf axe, axe, but I understand that they were the talk of the town when they were um, in use. He brought his skill from, uh, from New England, England to Wadsworth, and he's buried in Wadsworth Cemetery. Now, he, Albert Hinsdale um, was not a hero because he made axes. I, uh, uh, Albert Hinsdale was a hero because he produced a family, uh, generations of families that actually became very prominent in Wadsworth and in the United States 
both in the area of education and in the area of medicine. And they came uh, all as the result of um, John Everhart bringing those people with him, or not bringing, or permitting them to come with him when he, um, um, when, when, when he uh, worked at the, at the uh, Wadsworth Farm in, in um, uh, Canfield. I'm going to step back now just a little bit to tell you about some of the people who <clears throat> made themselves heroes, but they really weren't. We're going to be talking about Philemon Kirkman. Now, it's a strange name, P-H-I-L-I-M-I-N, Kirkman, K-I-R-K-M-A-N. Now, Philemon Kirkman was a person who lived in Connecticut, and um, he was a very, very good orator. And he taught himself law. And when you say you taught yourself law, that's how lawyers became lawyers. They studied with someone, read books, and so forth, and then they passed the test and they became lawyers. Now you have to go to school for at least three years after your undergraduate degree. But at that time, that's how you became a lawyer. He had a little bit of a problem, very arrogant. And he also had a short temper. So when he got into the courtroom, when he was supposed to be presenting cases, Instead of presenting cases, he would take the judge on. And of course, you know, don't, don't mess with a person who has the badge and a gun. And the judge has the badge and the gun in the courtroom. So it didn't take long for him to become disenfranchised from the courts and then to become uh, disenchanted with his life. So he said, I'm not going to be a lawyer anymore. I'm not going to do anything because these people are all crazy and they don't want to listen to me. Now I'm paraphrasing. He did, probably didn't say that, but that's what he, that's what uh, the books say. So he said, you know, I'm a Democrat, and I believe in um, helping everybody out. So what happened at this point was that he made himself a little grocery store, and no one had to pay for any of the things, but they would have to supply. Uh, what they uh, took and um, uh, have to give labor for what they took and have to uh, show good example to other people for what they took. Well, there's an old saying that human nature is always and everywhere the same. These people did not resupply what they took. They did not help out the neighbor for what they took. They didn't do anything of those things, and he went bust. So he said, well, this isn't going to work. Well, I think that any first grader could have told him that to begin with. But nonetheless, he said, well, I'm going to go over to that new settlement, uh, the, the, the new settlement over there in Wadsworth. So he came here. Now, they had a party for him not because they liked him, but they were so glad to get rid of him that they, they had a party for him. He came to Wadsworth and said, you know, I think that I can probably make it here because these people probably do not know anything about me, and probably didn't. And what's in there? <laughs> what? Hey, thank you very much. I, um, I put that right there for the moment. Um, so he came to Wadsworth. Now he had three things going for him. He had a beautiful, beautiful centurion voice and people liked to listen to him. Number two, I mean, he was crazy, but he was not ignorant. I mean, he was pretty bright. And number three, he was very good looking. Six feet three, according to this man, or to, to, the, um, uh, to, the, to the history, six feet three. And in those days, men were not that tall because as we all know, we are taller now than we were many, many years ago. Some people are heavier now than they were many, many years ago. But uh, tall was one of the things that they, they really enjoyed. And smart enough so he can become a teacher. Now a teacher in those days had to be able to read and write and cipher and know um, a little bit about religion and they can teach, a person can teach. And at the time, uh, this is where I start drifting off because I want to tell another story but I can't tell that another story right now because uh, then I'll tell another story on top of that one, and, and that's not good. But uh, Philemon, uh, uh, Philemon um, 
uh, uh, Philemon Kirkman, Kirkman uh, began teaching. And he's a very good teacher. And of course, you know, he didn't have to worry about the judge telling him that he could or could not do these things. He had little children out there. So you will do this, they did this. You will do that, and they did that. And then he would take his horse and ride all the way from what his hut that he had, which was supposedly, I'm going to guess, somewhere along the east-west road, which we now call Broad Street, the east-west road, and he would ride it all the way into the center of the settlement, which of course would be where we're sitting right now. And um, he stood on his, uh, he sat on his horse with such stature that people would say, oh my, look at him go. And he would always wear a blue, bright blue jacket and a white um, something shirt, uh, but uh, that's not what they call them, the thing that you put around your neck, a dicky or whatever it is, and white trousers and black boots. Well, he was striking. And they liked him so well that they actually made him one of their heroes, and he's actually buried in Wadsworth, but he wasn't buried in Wadsworth to begin with. He was buried over in the, uh, the um, Norton Cemetery, um, the one on um, Madonna County Line Road. He was buried there. And then he was moved over here uh, to Woodlawn, uh, and there's a um, little bit of a, uh, a monument to him, and his wife is buried there as well. So those, they, Wadsworth made him a hero. He came from, from the stable to the stars, um, simply because he moved to, to Wadsworth. Now, we, we want to get back to the Brown family because we have um, a couple of things we, we haven't talked about yet, and that was Frederick Brown. Frederick Brown actually moved to Wadsworth in 1816, and he was considered early on as Wadsworth's big man. He built the first house in the, in the middle of town, the first house in the middle of town. Now, he had a wife whose name was Chloe. Now, Frederick and Chloe were not the highly, most highly educated people around. However, they were very learned, and there's a big difference. Um, some people have a PhD and they're not learned. But this man was learned and he didn't have a PhD. But he produced four children, Dr. Marcus, Dr. John, Reverend Edward, and we're going to be talking about Reverend Edward, and then of course, Catherine, no title at all. Why? Because women, you know, I'm not going to finish the sentence because I want to live tonight. But Catherine, but Catherine married Timothy Hudson. You've heard that name Hudson, haven't you? Timothy Hudson's father was the person who settled Hudson, Ohio. So we have Frederick and Chloe as being heroes in Wadsworth because not only did they produce four children who not, not only made good, but they did really, really good. And then we have the Reverend Edward Brown who wrote the first history of the city of, of the uh, settlement of Wadsworth in 1864. Now, why uh, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to have to fudge on the 1864 because there are some um, sources that say that he started writing it uh, three to four years before the 60th anniversary. Now, why did we have the 60th anniversary, not the 50th anniversary of the city of Wadsworth? What happened in 1861? Audience participation? Civil War. No way that you're going to have any kind of a celebration. Incidentally, what happened in the 100th anniversary, 1914? World War I. So we didn't have anything from 1864 until 1939 because we had a couple little skirmishes in there, one called the Civil War and the other one called and I don't mean to minimize those, those are horrible. They were World War I. So 
Edward Brown wrote the, and he wrote the names of every single solitary person who lived in Wadsworth and what that person were, was doing and where he was, uh, he or she were married and so forth. Now, a minute ago I said that Catherine had no title. And you say, well, that was a long time ago. People, in 1914 we had a census in Wadsworth and we, sent, we, we censused, or we uh, took the census of, uh, and showed only men and boys, no women, 1914. Not too many years ago. There are people, well, there's no one here who was born 1914, but a couple fairly close to <laughs> 1914. The <clears throat> one thing that we know about the Browns also is the fact that um, John Brown, the abolitionist, and I'm not going to go into that big long story because that would take forever also, and you all, you all know it. You know the songs, John Brown, and um, you know what he did and how he was, uh, um, how he met his end and all those other kinds of things. However, uh, Owen Brown was not, as I said, not too terribly much of, a, um, of an individual who was uh, literate, uh, but he had a lot of good sense. And Owen Brown is responsible for the East-West Road, which we call Broad Street and College Street, from Hudson, where he was a county commissioner of the, which county? Trumbull County at that time, of which we were members, he had authority to say there's going to be a road between Norton and Lodi, which was not called Lodi at that time, Lodi. So the Browns, here again, became a hero. If it weren't for that, you would probably, well, I'm sure we would have a road there now, but that was why we have the road there, because he was actually the person who, who made that road. Now, as I say, he, was an, he, was a, um, he had good common sense, but uh, Edward Brown and Frederick Brown, uh, Edward particularly, who lived in Wadsworth, uh, actually tutored or was mentored, it was a better word, he didn't tutor him, he mentored uh, John Brown, the abolitionist. So we have a hero there, now, you can say what you want to about John Brown, the abolitionist, whether you do or do not agree with what he did or how he did it or whatever. And I know that there are two sides to every story, and I know fully well also that there are some emotional things about uh, slavery and all of those things. But nonetheless, he is a national hero. As a matter of fact, you can go to Arizona and say John Brown, and they'll say the abolitionist. Or you can go to Alaska and say John Brown, he's the abolitionist. Or you can go to Wadsworth, Ohio and say John Brown. Oh, Owen's son and Edward's nephew, because he was right here. He came to Wadsworth all the time, simply because he wanted to talk to his, his father, his uh, uncle. The um, Frederick Brown then was inspired by the fact that um, uh, Owen Brown was the, the county commissioner for Trumbull County and was able to get the Wadsworth Road here. Frederick Brown said, wait, wait a minute. We, <laughs> there are four, uh, four cardinal points, north, east, south, and west. Now we have east and west taken care of as far as roads are concerned, but we don't have north and south. So Frederick Brown became a hero by making the road go from here to Granger. Now, why Granger? Because as a bird, a bird looks at this, it's a straight line to Cleveland. Now Cleveland was already established, but Cleveland was established in 18, or 1796, which was only six, or what, 16 years, uh, 14, six, uh, four, uh, 18 years, 18 years before Wadsworth. But it was a seaport city, or lake city, actually, and it was growing fast, so he wanted to be able to go there. Now, a problem came. The Connecticut Western Reserve, the Connecticut Western Reserve is divided into um, 25 uh, square miles of, uh, of, of uh, property. And the 16th section was supposed to be for government, um, schools, education, and religion. 
Wadsworth did not put its school, its government, or its, what's the third one? Religion. In the 16th district, they put in the 15th. The 16th district is down where, where um, Ashram School is right now. And that's going to play a, an important role in what I'm going to say next. Why is it there? One of the reasons that has been touted is the fact that it's kind of swampy down there. As a matter of fact, it was flooded out one time and flooded out the, the, the race uh, track, that was, uh, which is now AC Field. And I won't get into that one because that's another long story. However, they built it up here on top of the hill so that they didn't have the flooding. That's one of the reasons, and whether that's a good reason or not, we're not going to argue with at this point. But Sharon built its center in the 16th district, or 16th square, or 16th uh, section. Now, if you go from here to Sharon, you have to make a big, big, long turn to get into Sharon because we go directly a mile west of, east of Sharon if you go straight up State Road. So many years ago, as you know where Clark's Corners is, that was built there so that you can go into the 16th section of Sharon Township without uh, having to go to uh, a mile um, east and then to turn west to go to the center of the town. So uh, Frederick Brown then made this road, which we now call State Road, or he, uh, he was the one who uh, promoted it, which we call State Road. So he was one of our heroes, so we can get to Cleveland. And oh, by the way, um, <clears throat> we talked about Hudson being the first, or the person who's, um, who settled and that the, his son married Catherine um, Brown, uh, and um, Hudson then, we, we have the Hudsons who uh, lived in Wadsworth and uh, settled Hudson, Ohio. Were you aware of the fact that um, a man by the name of Ely lived in Wadsworth, and he settled a city, and would you be like to guess what the name of that city is? Elyria. And we have two of his great, 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 great grand nieces living in Wadsworth. And when we had our uh, uh, bicentennial last year, uh, this came out, and she showed me the papers where the where the, um, the town was named after this her great, 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 great uncle there. Now. <clears throat> Let's go to another a couple of families who are also heroes. Um, have you ever heard of a chain store? Of course you have. And um, do we have them? Of course we do. Uh, did they have them in, in 1850 or so? The answer is yes. We had one in Wadsworth. A man by the name of Harvey Spellman. Now Harvey Spellman usually is considered a hero because he had a daughter whose name was Laura Spellman. Incidentally, Spellman is spelled S-P-E-L-M-A-N. One L, no two L's. Harvey Spellman had a store in Wadsworth, which is right next to School Drive. and ain't there no more, however, because we tear it down. We tore it down. But it's, there was a, a building right next to School Drive, and he had his clothing store on the, on the basement, or the bottom part of it, and the top part was his residence, and Laura Spellman was born there. Now you, th you think to yourself, well, so? I mean, a lot of people are born there. <laughs> people are born in Wadsworth. Laura Spellman, uh, they moved to Cleveland after a while, and then, and then she met a classmate, his name is uh, John liked John really well and married him. And John's last name was Rockefeller. And uh, you've heard that name, I'm sure. Well, at age 26, John Rockefeller bought interest in the um, um, refinery business. Uh, and I'm not going to go into that, uh, that whole episode because it took uh, PBS uh, seven different um, hours to 
tell the story about uh, John D. Rockefeller, and I'm not going to do it today. But anyway, um, she married him. And by age 36, he owned all of the refineries, or he had interest or owned all of the refineries in the state of, of uh, or the, in, in the United States and was the richest man in the world. Now, a little aside. I was on the committee when we had our 175th anniversary, and um, we got a letter from one of the Rockefeller great-great-grandchildren. And he wrote and he said, um, I would like to come to see where my great-great-grandmother was born. She was right there in Wadsworth. We had to write back and say, it's a parking lot now. <laughs> now, I have dreamed time and again where that thing would still be there and John Jr., 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 whatever his name is, would have come here. Oh, my poor grandmother, she would be so proud of me. I'll give you $14 million just to kind of keep things, keep cool here, to keep this house going. It didn't happen. Matter of fact, he didn't even come to the, to the ceremony, but he was going to come to the ceremony. And that was 1979, something like that. Well, anyway, the um, store that he had was one of three, and it was one of the first chain stores, supposedly, in the entire United States. And the first one was in Middlebury. Middlebury is now called Ellet in Akron. That's East Akron, kind of Southeast Akron, isn't it? Yeah, Southeast Akron. And that was called uh, the first one, and then he had one here, and then he had one in Cleveland. And he went, up, went to Cleveland to, to work in that store, and then his daughter went to school and she met uh, John. She liked John really well, and they got married. So that was that took care of, of, the, of the John. Now, we've had scores of scores of scores of things written about the Pardees. The one thing that you can say about the Pardees is that not one of them um, was on welfare. They were all wealthy. They made money on their own. They became doctors. They became judges. They became politicians. And Aaron Pardee, the old man, actually became the first mayor of Wadsworth. Now, I was the mayor of Wadsworth, and I spent, I don't know how many times, how many months uh, campaigning. Actually, I really didn't. Um, simply because uh, I was the principal of a school at that time, uh, helping out because the principal had um, resigned. And um, ethically, I could not do it. So Linda, my wife, did it. She put up all the signs. And the joke was that, um, well, it wasn't a joke. I said, if I, if I win the mayorship, I'm going to leave the, the school. And it happened to be Sacred Heart uh, School here in Wadsworth. And the pastor, Father Joe, <laughs> said, well, Linda, you can put up all the signs you want to go. I'm going to be right behind you to pull them up. <laughs> and on the day of election, I had to actually leave the school because um, uh, ethically I could not stay there while they were, because they were voting in the school. That's when we still voted in the school, so we don't anymore. But uh, they, they, uh, I had to leave the school, so I, actually I didn't do too terribly much for, for that. But nonetheless, nonetheless, I was duly elected by the people in the city of Wazza. Now, why am I saying that? Because in uh, about 1876 or 7, somebody said downtown, hey, you know what, we need a mayor. Okay, well, what you doing Saturday night? Well, uh, after supper, not too much. Let's meet over there at the carriage house. Well, who, who else should come? I don't know, uh, at least one more guy. So three of them met, and they voted for Aaron Pardee to become the mayor of Wadsworth, and he did. So he was the first mayor of Wadsworth. We have changed that essentially, obviously. We've changed that so many, many times. But nonetheless, um, that, that's how he became. Uh, that's how he became mayor. The one story that I like to tell about the party, and I'm not going to go into all of the stories about the parties, 
but I do know the, some of these things on a personal basis because I worked with Caroline Party. Incidentally, uh, where's the man who's in charge here? He left? He left. Bored and he left. <laughs> Um, I, I don't know how, many, how long I'm supposed to talk, but anyway, I'm, I'll keep on talking until he stops me, or until you, until you leave, or whatever. But um, the, um, the party, um, the last of the parties who's buried in Wadsworth is the Caroline Party, and I worked with her for 30 years, so I learned so many things, and I spent many, many hours in her home. She had a museum for a home. As a matter of fact, you couldn't find a place to sit, because they had all of these things that were... Um, um, memorabilia from the party family. So I learned about um, who they were, what they did, and what they didn't do, and, and all of those kinds of things. And one of the nice, the the, my, pres my favorite story about the parties that she told me about, and then I, I found that, in, uh, David, I think you did too, didn't you, about the nails? You'll, I'm sure you'll, you'll recognize it, yeah. They, um, David was there, I think. <laughs> they built the, the most beautiful house, uh, according to the Beacon Journal, it was the most beautiful house in the state of Ohio. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what the Beacon Journal said. But they say that about a lot of rich people. But anyway, where the block is downtown, where the Citizens Bank is, all the way up to halfway between that and Party Street, now, let's, let's call it Watrusa. Watrusa wasn't there at that time, but it is there now. On the east side of Watrusa, all the way to Main Street, did not belong to the parties, but from almost where the Watrusa is, not exactly, almost where Watrusa is, all the way to Party Street, from College Street all the way back to Mill Street, and Mill Street was, uh, was there, but it wasn't called Mill Street at the time, belonged to the parties. And they put this beautiful, beautiful home there. They had the wood, and there was wood cut that was actually um, uh, cut from the oak trees down in the Silver Creek Valley. Now, that's going to come up again in, in another way, the, the oak trees down there. But they had all of the oak uh, the, that was, uh, there he comes, he's come back in. How, late, how, how long am I allowed to talk? Oh. <laughs> I see. Okay, well, these people are my age. They're not going to sit there that long. As a matter of fact, in about one minute, we're going to stand up for a little second because um, <laughs> we're all afraid of getting blood clots in our legs. <laughs> That's true. I broke my a bone on my hip about uh, four months ago, and um, I had to sit in the chair for 44 days without moving except to go to the bathroom. And every 15 minutes, I had to do the exercises in my legs so that I would not get a blood clot. And I keep on thinking, thank God I didn't. But then I found out from my doctor yesterday when I went to him that the blood clot can stay on for, for a long, long time. And when, when you're at least thinking about it, boom, <laughs> takes care of it. So we're going to get up in a couple of seconds. So I don't, I don't want anyone to go out of here dead tonight. <laughs> anyway, the, um, I built this house. Had a plan, and they had a per, an architect plan it and so forth. And they, they started to build. They had the boards. They had absolutely everything. They didn't have enough nails. Now, <laughs> go to the hardware store and get some more nails. That's not the way it's done. They had to wait until the next spring, and they got every blacksmith in the city of Wadsworth, and, and there were many of them because uh, blacksmiths were a dime a dozen at that time, and in all of Medina County, to build or to make enough nails so that they could start the following year and build the house. So it took them an entire year to make the nails for the house. Now, I suspect that we can call those guys heroes, all those blacksmiths, because I'm sure that they got a pretty good penny for, for the nails um, because they were such a, in such demand. Unfortunately, just as we did with um, uh, Spellman's store. Unfortunately, we uh, tore that house down about 1940 or so and made three three of them. And now you can't tell anything about it so far. Let's all stand for a couple seconds. We've been sitting for an hour and. Uh, 
this makes me feel so good. You all get up the same way I do. <laughs> Let's go to Marvin Kent. One of the nice things that happens in Wadsworth is that we have a railroad. If we're not for the fact that we had a railroad, we would probably be not be Wadsworth. We would be Wadsworth only in name and would not have what we have here, factories and everything else. Marvin Kent, and you'll know his name because a city was named after him after it was no longer, it was, uh, uh, before that it was, um, um, it'll come to me in a second. And I don't need to, uh, don't need to apologize because you all know what happens when you're 85 years old, you can't think of anybody, anything right off the bat. Um, but Marvin Kent had this dream about having a railroad between Kent and Warren. Well, there's a lot, there were a lot of politics involved with, with railroads at that time. Of course, it's no different today, I'm sure. But there was a tremendous amount of, um, um, of, of political um, maneuvering that had to come as a result of the railroad. So he, um, instead of uh, wanting to uh, be completely honest in saying to the people in the railroad industry, uh, I want to connect New York and St. Louis. Well, he knew fully well that they would say no. So what he thought he would do would be to connect Kent and, uh, and um, Warren, which is made, what, 70 miles, something like that, uh, 50, 60 to 70 miles. And then he th thought, he, thought him to himself, well, when I get that piece done, then we'll kind of make a little bit of a uh, contract with some of the other people who have from, say for instance, from, um, Warren to um, Eastern Pennsylvania, or Western Pennsylvania, and we'll kind of get them together. And eventually, we'll have the railroad from from New York all the way to to St. Louis. I think that's good. You're tardy. Recess was over one minute ago. <laughs> well, it didn't. It, it worked. It really worked. However, he ran out of money. Remember, this was in 1862. What was happening in 1862? Civil War. Civil War. And things were very, very bad at that time, and he ran out of money. So he said, you know, um, maybe I can get some people to give us some money. And he thought to himself, well, if I run this railroad through Doylestown, I can get all the coal that's in Doylestown, because Doylestown was a coal mining community at that time. However, the trains couldn't go up the huge grade in, Young, in, in Doylestown, so he thought that he would build the railroad and make the center of it Western Star. Incidentally, if I'll stop just for a quarter of a second, people, do you realize that Western Star is a name and it's a little city and where did it get its name? People have all kinds of ideas, however, I think that I have found the real reason that we called it Western Star, and that is that Elijah Wadsworth was a big mason, and he brought masonry to Ohio in 1797. Yes, 1797. And he named all of his, and he had several of them, all of his, um, what were they called, what were the, the, uh, the uh, units of masonry? What? What are they? Lodges. lodges. All of the lodges, all of them were called Western Star. Now, isn't it strange that we have a little community which he owned that he called Western Star? So I think there might be something there. I mean, I'm not sure that that's it, but that makes a lot, whole lot better sense than uh, what we've been talking about for many, many years. We had a man whose name was Star, and he was in the western part of the Connecticut Western Verse, so they call it Western Star. I don't think that has anything to do with it. But anyway, Western Star was going to, to be the, the community at which point um, uh, there would be a station. Enter now Gaylord Loomis, and we haven't talked about him yet, and he is a real hero in Wadsworth. Gaylord Loomis and Orlando Beach, and they took $5,000. Now, you bankers here, and I'm sure we have several of them, 
you bankers here can probably tell me how, how much five thousand dollars would be in today's, but I'd be probably five million dollars. I mean, I, I'm not, I have no idea, but it's a tremendous amount of money, five thousand dollars. As a result, the station came to Wadsworth instead of to Western Star. Well, <clears throat> a good thing that it did because as a result of that. We had three different industries that were able to use the railroad. First and foremost was the brick industry. And the brick industry did not start down where the brickyard is right now. The brick industry started on the uh, Hiram Yaki farm, which is on Silver Creek, which happens to be actually across the road from where I live. And I'm always proud of the fact that this was the first brickyard and why, I have no idea. <laughs> it's the only thing that, 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 that uh, dignifies the, the community of Silver Creek because it, it is such a small community. And he was able to ship his bricks by rail, and all he had to do was to have a cart and it rolled down the hill, and he put them on the railroad track, and then he sent them. Now, in 1893, uh, someone came to him and said, you know, uh, Hiram, <clears throat> You have a wonderful, wonderful thing going here, but you know, you have 160 acres of land here, and only about seven of it, seven acres, has the kind of clay for brick. The rest of it is good agricultural land, and it is. So in, 17, or in 1893, he abandoned his um, brickyard and began, began farming and built a barn and a house right there, and it remained a farm until about uh, 50 years ago, and now it has about 4,000 thousand, 4, houses, well, not that many, but <clears throat> a lot of houses on it. And um, that's uh, one of them. The second one was that the match company was able to send its matches by, by rail uh, because before that, they had to take them by horse and wagon. Now, there's a story behind that, and that brings into the other hero, Marvin, or rather, um, um, Shapiro. Um, hmm. Here, you, you, Hugo Shapiro, Hugo Shapiro. In 1910, uh, Hugo Shapiro uh, was, a, was a, a chemist who came from Germany and um, was hired by the Diamond Match Company in Barberton to work on the chemistry of the matches because two things were happening. Number one, the uh, chemicals that were used in the matches were actually um, poisonous and people were dying or becoming very ill and dying. And number two, they had what was spontaneous combustion. In other words, just looking at the matches and they would start burning and that's not good. Hugo Shapiro corrected both of those. And uh, Hugo Shapiro then uh, became <clears throat> not only the hero of Wadsworth, but the hero of all the match industry in the entire world. And we have a tremendous amount of match companies in the world. According to some of our legends, the Ohio Match Company here in Wadsworth was the largest match company in the entire world. I don't know if that's true or not, but no one has disputed it, so we're going to go with that. The other thing that I think is a hero is that the match shop itself is a, is a hero because it has 1,600 workers, of whom 600 were females, and it was the only factory anywhere around where females were permitted to work. And not only were they permitted to work, but according to the people who were the, uh, uh, the youngs said that the women <clears throat> who worked in the match company were outsmarted the men. The men did all this heavy work. They did the lifting work and so forth. I worked in the match company. It was called a mule. Now that's kind of, that's just, well, I was. Uh, they put boxes of um, matches on a, on a cart, and I push them, like a mule would push them. And that's what the men did. But the women, and I actually saw them because I worked in this one department, where they, in the book match, where they would have, their fingers were all wrapped up because they would have to go down and pick up 13 and 12, 13 and 12, 13 and 12, that fast, 13 and 12, and they never missed. You put 25 in a box, 13 and 12, 13 and 12, 13 and 12. They were wonderful. 
and they uh, they were actually lauded. They, uh, the match company even had what they called what they call, had what they called the match shop girls. They so the match shop is a hero, and I'm saying this for political reasons. The match shop is a hero because it had such a distinct distinctive respect for women. Now you're supposed to clap on that one. So. Oh. <laughs> But no, I, I, I'm very true that that's true. Now, we other have another hero in Wadsworth, and that's James K. Derling. We talked about Marvin Kent having this railroad. When it was time for the first shovel to be, to be um, shoveled, they called upon the one person in Wadsworth who had a lot of money and a lot of influence, and that was J.K. Derling. Now, there are a lot of Derlings in Wadsworth. As a matter of fact, we have a Derling Drive, which is named after J.K. Derling. Uh, well, not necessarily J.K., but the Durning family. And uh, that's another long story. We're not going to go into that one because it went bust. But um, he was asked to turn the first shovelful of dirt in Kent to make the railroad come to Wadsworth. So another hero. Very, very few people probably rem remember that. I'm going to skip over it because um, our uh, cameraman tells me that I have just a few more minutes left here and I have enough material that could take us probably another couple hours, but we're not going to do that, obviously. Don't get scared. Um, I'm going to talk about Eurastus Loomis. What mommy would name her child Eurastus? I have no idea, particularly if her last name is Loomis. But we have Sherman and Lodemia, Sure, uh, uh, Loomis, who were school teachers, and they were teachers here in the first, in the um, very first um, schools that we had in Wadsworth. One of which was at the end of Hartman Road, and the second one was at the other end of Hartman Road. But it was a Hartman Road at that time; it wasn't even a road, um, just kind of a pathway. As a matter of fact, uh, I remember it when it didn't go all the way through to 261 as a full road. Or just a, you, you remember it too, you know. Uh, you're nodding your head. <laughs> I thought you remembered it. No? Mm. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, those two were school teachers, and they didn't get very much money. As a matter of fact, they didn't get, didn't get any money for a long time. They, they got wheat and perhaps a little bit of meat or something like that for the people. And um, Erasmus, incidentally, his middle name was Gaylord, and I'm hoping that they called him Gay. This poor guy. <laughs> loser all the way through, <laughs> Erasmus, and then his, his middle name is Gaylord. But uh, Gaylord, um, of course, he can, he can have any name he wants to be, because he became the wealthiest man in Wandsworth. But Gaylord uh, Loomis, Erasmus Loomis, said, I'm not going to live a life as my parents have lived. I'm not going to be a school teacher because I can't be poor all my life. So he went to the Pardee brothers and he said, you have a store, I would like very, very much to become part of your store. I'll do anything you want me to and I want to learn how to be a, a good uh, storekeeper. And he did that. And he actually prospered. Now, the railroad came through in about 1865 or something very, very close to that. And um, he said, wow, I see an opportunity here. If you notice, at the Silver Creek crossing, and you'll hear a lot about Silver Creek, Silver Creek is a very historic place. I lived there, but I, haven't, I did not make the history of it, but history of the, uh, it's a very historic place. Silver Creek crossing is at the very, very top of a hill or a, an incline that starts beyond Barberton and goes for seven straight miles all the way up. Now, it's a, it's a, it's a gradual grade, obviously. And it starts at Silver Creek Road and goes all the way beyond Ripman for seven miles also. It's the highest, most difficult part of the Erie Railroad between New York and Chicago for a train to pass. Well, now we have diesels and they do a pretty good job. At that time, it was a chug, 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 chug. And they would stop time and time and time again by the time that they got the top of Silver Creek Crossing. Smart, Gaylord Loomis said, I have an idea. There are 100, almost 100 acres of, of wood 
right there where the, the train stops. That would be the Wise Farm. I will cut it down, chop it up, and when they stop, say, hey, need wood? And of course they do it. So he would sell them the wood. And as he was doing this, now this is what the story goes, and of course, you know, um, I'm going to offend somebody, I'm sure, but um, history isn't always exactly <laughs> what's in the book. I mean, sometimes it's, it's, it's not made up necessarily, but it's made better. But according to the, to, to the uh, writings, um, and this actually comes from some of the letters that uh, are written, um, Loomis, Gaylord, or Erasmus Loomis, was um, at the far south end of this big wooded area, and he saw pieces of coal on the, on the ground. Well, he wasn't the first person to see pieces of coal on the ground. Many people knew about that coal on the ground. And they went and picked it up and used it for their own coal stoves or whatever. But Loomis said, well, you know, if there's coal here, if we dig in, there's going to be coal there. Well, he dug in and he found what is called the uh, Massillon coal uh, vein, which covers three quarters of the city of Wadsworth. The only part of Wadsworth that it does not cover is the southeastern, southwestern portion. Uh, portion. But everything else in Wadsworth, under, you're sitting on coal right now. I mean, there's coal under here. There, um, according to one of, the, uh, one of the prospects, we have over 400 years of coal sitting underneath Wadsworth right now. Well, we don't use it so much anymore, so it, um, I had the pleasure of being in the last coal mine that was closed on the day that it was closed in 1935. And the reason it was closed was that the mule had drowned the, year be the, the day before and uh, he didn't want to keep it up anymore. My neighbor was the, the owner of the mine, John Mullaney. But anyway, when uh, he saw the coal, he began, doing, uh, he began um, uh, mining coal. And the same trains then went from wood to coal. So instead of selling them wood, he sold them coal. And he became a very famous icon in the city of Wazwick because he had tons and tons of money and he made it from the coal and from the lumber. As a matter of fact, um, he didn't have enough lumber here in Wadsworth, so he went to uh, Michigan, and the name of the city in Michigan is called Loomis, Michigan. It was named after him. He bought 400 acres of, of uh, wood up there, and then he went to um, Kansas and bought, did the same thing. So he had a lot of money. Uh, so much money that he made the first three-story building in Medina County called the Odd Fellows, right there in the middle of the square. And there is a story that says that the Union School, which cost $25,000 to build, he actually put out the $25,000. No evidence of that in any of the school records, so you take that for a grain of salt. But anyway, when the uh, coal uh, came by, the same trains had to stop, and he sold them coal. And then he thought, by himself. Well, you know, other people are going to build um, um, mines here because this place is so, so replete with mines. And he said, I'm going to put a little railroad from here, Silver Creek, all the way up to what we now call Rhymer Road, but was called Stony Ridge Road at that time. And I won't go into the whole story of why we call it Stony Ridge Road, because that'll take a little, little time too. But uh, he built a railroad, and he called it the Silver Creek Railroad. There's still remnants of it. As a matter of fact, about four or five years ago, I phone, got a phone call on the Saturday afternoon. A woman called and said, I'm here with my Boy Scout troop, and um, we um, have found some railroad ties, and they were up there on the uh, east, west side of Hartman Road, north of 261, and that's where the, the railroad went. It went all the way up to... Um, uh, Stony Ridge Road or, or uh, Rhymer Road, and um, she said, was there a railroad here? Yes, there was. I said, oh, where are you standing? She said, told me where she was standing. I said, turn around. I said, she was at that time looking straight south at 6 o'clock. I said, turn around and move yourself to 10 o'clock, and about a mile from where you are, um, you will see the um, um, the, the openings of the biggest mines we had of the, of, of, in Wadsworth, there were 27 of them, by uh, a fellow by the name of Card from Cleveland owned them. 
And she said, oh, just a second. And she came back and said, yep, it's um, actually three quarters of a mile. I said, how do you know that? I said, well, I have a scope here or something. I said, well, so much for Boy Scouts um, rubbing stones together that makes fire. That's good. But um, the, uh, the railroad, there are still remnants of the railroad up there. It went from there, from Silver Creek all the way up to there. And then as a result of having that railroad, the Card family from Cleveland actually built uh, mines up there. And the last mine is on the, uh, almost at the intersection of uh, Reimer Road and what is now um, That other road <laughs> that goes the other way. Um, can't think of it right this very second. It'll come to me. And I'm not going to apologize because you all have the same problem at my age. But <clears throat> anyway, uh, the reason that they stopped is that they hit a rock. Now when I say they hit a rock, they hit a rock, not rocks, rock. Jump way back uh, up here to 2003. I was mayor at the time, and they were going to build a fire station up there. And I told them, I said, you're going to hit a rock up there. So, oh, no, 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 we did a geological, and there's no, nothing up there. The man lost his shirt because he had to get, bring in a special type of machinery to dig in that fire station. Fire station number two is on top of that rock. So that's why they stopped. Well, I'm, that's what I'm afraid of. I always get these little other stories going on, too. And... Um, Erasmus Loomis then lost his credibility. And of course in today's world, we would say that uh, politically he was not too, uh, the, the people in Boston were not too correct. However, from a report that I received today from the radio, not I received it, but it was on the radio today, that uh, we are further behind in race relations than we were some years ago. And I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what it was said on the radio. And I believe everything the radio tells me. But anyway, the, um, the, the unfortunate thing is that uh, they had a coal strike. And I'm not going to go into the big reason for the coal strike, but uh, they wanted more than $1.50 an hour for 15 hours of, of work a day, or 16 hours of work a day. Can you imagine the greed of wanting more than $1.50 an hour for working for 16 hours? But anyway, they, um, they wanted that money. And um, um, Erasmus Luzma said, well, oh, fix you. I'll bring in some people here who need the money. And he went down to West Virginia, uh, Tennessee, and Alabama and brought in 200 Afro-Americans. And Wadsworth at that time was such that we had the English from the East and we had the Pennsylvania Dutch from Pennsylvania. And if they happened to actually fall in love and marry with one another, it was considered a mixed marriage for 40 years. Now, bring in a different color and see what happens at Wadsworth. They absolutely rebelled. So much so that they had to build a stockade down in Hammertown, which is about uh, three miles south and a little bit east of uh, where the coal mine was. And even with the stockade, they had to bring in the militia to guard it for six months because they were going to destroy them. Well, after the coal mine was, uh, the coal um, strike was over, all but 15 families went back to their hometowns and the 15 families came here and lived in Wadsworth and they all settled on Mill Street at that time. And um, for many, many years we had only those families and of course I've proliferated at this point, but uh, that, that's what we had. I want to quickly go into another thing that we have here in Wadsworth in addition to um, coal. We have whetstone. Those of us who are old enough to remember, Dennis used to use wet stones to grind our teeth, and it was horrible because it would granulate, and, and uh, but um, that's what they use. Now they use uh, diamonds and I don't know whatever they, whatever they use, but it doesn't uh, disintegrate in your mouth. Accordingly, we had a person whose name was Daniel Webster Hard, H-E-R-D. He married into the um, Hardy family. Uh, and uh, one of them became a sheriff in 1890, went down to Florida, was murdered. Uh, that has, I mean, uh, that is not of historical uh, evidence, but, or a distinction, but um, nonetheless, uh, they were very prominent here in the Wadsworth area and uh, very powerful, the Hard family. And he had a whetstone mine, which is on the northwest corner 
of 261 and Hartman Road, and it was supposedly the very, very best, very, very best um, whetstone in the world. Now, people can make those kinds of statements. I don't know how you, how you uh, evaluate uh, whetstone, but nonetheless, that's what, that's what they said that they had. The um, <clears throat> Young family, as we well know, has been very prominent in Wadsworth. I'm not, not, I'm not going to minimize what they did. As a matter of fact, after the coal uh, mines closed up, Wadsworth became the uh, industrial community that it did, and probably every family here in Wadsworth either worked at the match, salt, box board, or injector, or knew someone who did, and we all want to say thank you to those heroes who made life, and I'm hurrying quickly because I'm getting the signal that I have to stop in about one and a half minutes. And uh, another one is William Artman, and uh, I'm skipping over several of them here, but William Artman in 1877, 1887. As a matter of fact, if I were to walk down the street right now and I would ask 100 people, who's William Artman? Unless I, and I, unless I walked into um, uh, David Rodish, who's sitting back there with a pink shirt on, if I would walk back, not one person would know who William Artman was. Some of you here would know, because you're all historians and of, a, of, a, of a nature. William Artman was a telegrapher, and a telegrapher at that time was uh, considered to be a very, very powerful um, skill, would be as far as I'm concerned right now, because I didn't know the Morse code either, but nonetheless, he was a telegrapher. And he came to Wadsworth, and he became the telegrapher at the, at the railroad uh, down at the um, um, station there, at the uh, depot, which no longer stands because we tore it down. And um, across the street from there was the injector company, was the Garfield injector at that time, was not the Ohio injector. And E.J. Young was, the, was, the, was one of the partners, and then he uh, finally bought it. But anyway, Artman went over there and he said, you know, um, I kind of like to become involved with this thing. Oh, good. So he did. Now, Artman was a brilliant, brilliant man. He had a mind that really, really went off forward. And so much so that um, he became the hero for the Ohio Injector, the Ohio Match Company, the Ohio Boxport Company, the Wadsworth Salt, not the Ohio Salt, but the Wadsworth Salt, which burned down in 1928. And he was a hero for those people because he was able to make one tremendous impact after another that made those companies great. That was William Artman. But he didn't stop there. We have electricity right here from the Wadsworth uh, Electric and, uh, uh, Power and Light. He was the one who started it. And I noticed some of you during your break, and good for you, went to the bathroom. He was the one who actually started the very first sewage system here in Wadsworth, and he bought the house on Main Street on the very last place where they had sewage because it didn't go all over, the, all over town. And when you came in, some of you got a drink, and he was the one who actually started the first water uh, works here in Wadsworth and got his water from the donor farm, which is north of 261, about a um, half mile to two, three quarters of a mile uh, east of 94, and the spring is still there, and they had the wooden pipes. In 1947, I was in school, um, and some of you were in school in 1947. I can see that um, Carol is here, and she, we, we both were in the school at the same time, same grade. And <clears throat> I was walking at noontime, uh, I have no idea why, because well, that's, all, that's the only recreation we had to watch at that time, was walking during the noon hour. And um, they were digging up a, one of the wooden pipes and they were going to throw it away. And I said, don't throw that away. Now, here I was, 17 years old at the time. I said, don't throw that away. That piece of pipe today stands in the fire station one as a, as a semblance of the first waterworks for the state of Ohio, and my cameraman says that I'm done. 